What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV. We got a crazy story, crazy case today. We're interviewing this brother, spent a bunch of time in prison in Florida. I believe he might have spent some time in Michigan, but it's crazy why he went to prison. Just absolutely outrageous. But anyway, Mike, tell the people who you are, where you're from, and let's talk about you. Uh, my name is Michael Holder, better known as Triple OG Dirty Red. I was born in Jackson, Michigan on September 15th, 1961. And uh, it's been a hell of a ride ever since, man. You know, um, I was born, uh, my mom was white and my dad was black. And uh, back in them days, over 60 years ago, that wasn't allowed, that was unacceptable. So my dad wasn't there when I was born. The doctor seen me come out of a white woman, he automatically assumed I was a white baby. So on my birth certificate, they wrote Michael Stephen Shear race Caucasian and um, my mom you know the family uh, disowned her because she was with a black man so she was put out homeless we were sleeping in cars wherever she could keep me at until CPS caught up with it and uh, they took me and put me in a uh, foster care and uh, finally she got with a rich white man named John Lawford out of Jasper Michigan and uh, he was racist, and uh, there was a lot of issues, you know. Um, I never went to school. I was young, and uh, we was living in the country in Jasper outside of Toledo, Ohio. And uh, it was all white. There was no black person there at all. And uh, one day I was young, probably about four or five, I was out playing in the ditch. And I seen, uh, you know, the dust flying up on the road, and uh, the car pulled up, stopped, grabbed me threw me in and took off and uh, took me up in the woods, man. And uh, it was my aunt and uncle. I went to school, I had a black eye because my stepdad put me over his knee and I hit the corner of the couch and gave myself a black eye and they thought he was abusing me because he was racist. So they kidnapped me and took me up in the woods and they were poor, but they were Christians. And um, at that time, you know, they had me going into Dixie dumpsters in the garbage cans and getting food out and savoring, you know, what wasn't, was still usable, you know, they'd be outdated. We, you know, they cook it for me, you know, it was, um, it was love. It was probably at that time, one of the happiest times of my life because they loved me, you know, even though they were poor and broke and they didn't have nothing, they loved me, you know, and. I haven't seen them, man. I, they they both passed since my aunt and uncle. You know, I haven't seen them. I don't, you know, in forever, man. But uh, I uh, came up like that. Then my aunt would have to always come and get me from school. I always get a busted lip or a black eye. I was always getting beat up. And I couldn't understand why. But it was because of the color of my skin. But it, it wasn't, you know, that different at that time. I, I couldn't understand it until as I got older. Uh, my mom finally got tired of me and she came and got me. It was about a year and a half, two years later, she came and got me. She had an extra key made and uh, she brought me to my dad in uh, Bay City, Michigan. My dad was a pimp and a hustler. And uh, he he kept me I, in 68, I was seven. He, he uh, him and his, one of his women, my, my stepmom, they were together and uh, he left. He left. I, at nine years old, I got locked up, man, sent away, put in a cell at Traverse City State Hospital. And I probably seen more deadly stuff there, you know, than I did in some of the prisons that I went into. But um, I, I went there and I wanted to be accepted. You know, I, I was white and black, but neither side wanted me or liked me because, you know, of who I was. So. It was hell, man. I went. Um, I got out in the streets early. I went. I went out into the streets. I had to make it on my own. I had to figure it out. And I was breaking in houses, stealing CBs and stereos out of the cars, just trying to make money to make a lot. Like a lot of the people I see you interview, the same thing. You know, starting out young and just never being able to get it together, you know, just constantly always staying locked up, always, always being locked up, man. I went uh, after I got that, um, I was 13 years old, downtown Bay City, Michigan, I robbed a bank, 
me and my brother was down there and they had the sidewalk days with the rides and that and i didn't have oh, man let me start at 13 years old you robbed a bank at 13. yeah 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 i robbed it and uh i didn't make it out the alley i got the money bag never even found out what was in the bag i never made it out the alley you know i just took off with the bag of money and ran and um I don't know what was there. I never made it, but I ended up going to boys training school. And uh, from 75 to 77, I was in boys training school. I was there when they, the Earl Flynn's from Detroit. I was there with a lot of the gangbangers and, uh, you know, the young ones that had murder cases, but they couldn't be tried as adults. So they sent them to boys training school, BTS. And um, it was PPC, Pure Positive Culture. And, I used to fight them. They used to, you know, take me down. And, you know, I never joined the gang. I never, never in my whole life, never joined anything. I've always been my own man. I, I ain't joined because I don't like nobody telling me what to do. I don't, you know, so I never joined nothing. I can't, can't nobody tell me, hey, go stab this dude. And that dude ain't did nothing to me. So, you know, I just, I follow me. And um, I went there till 77. I got out for probably 30 days or so. And then they sent me to Green Oak Center, maximum security. And I went there from 77 to 79. And uh, they couldn't hold me no more when I turned 18 years old. So they, uh, they let me out. And when I got out, I figured I was a man, I'm 18. You know, I'm a grown man now. I, you know, I hitchhiked to Florida trying to find my mom. And, um, uh, I made it down there, stayed a short time, and uh, came back to Michigan, and I went back. And um, I was back down there probably 30, 45 days, and I was in jail. And um, they sent me to prison, 18 years old. I went into Florida State Prison. That's where I met K-Wing Slim and Nigga Charlie. Uh, probably two words, I seen some things, man. I, stop, never... Let me stop you for a minute. You go down to Florida, right? And you end up in prison in Florida. What do you go to prison for down there, Michael? I, the first time I went was for burglary, uh, St. Petersburg, Florida. I uh, broke into Goodbye Outlet Clothing. And uh, they gave me 18 months in uh, Florida prison. And I went to the Indian River. I went to the river in 80. And, um, it was, you know, it, it was. It, it was rough, but it wasn't, you know, it was just life. I, I'm used to it. I've been fighting and acting a fool my whole damn life, you know, and I ain't had nothing to do. My family's in Michigan. I'm by myself. I'm in Florida. And I didn't, I, you know, I just didn't care. I just, whatever. And uh, I got, I, I maxed out of the hole. I was in solitary confinement. They shipped me out of Indian River and sent me to Hillsboro. There, them was the only two in 1980 for youthful offenders. And I went to Hillsboro and I studied fighting and acting a fool. And I I, I got out of solitary confinement. And uh, I remember the officer walking me to the door to be released. And he said, you'll be back. And I cussed him out, talk shit. I wasn't out probably 60 days. And I had 18 counts of armed robbery. And uh felon in possession of firearm, person engaged, criminal offense, having weapons bunch of charges um on robberies uh one particular that i remember clearly is um when i robbed the greyhound bus station in clearwater florida downtown clearwater broad daylight i took the money from all five tillers and i ran and ran up an alley to a dope house where they sell weed at and when i got up there i looked at the dude I said, man, I like that hat. I'll give you $20 for that hat. I got the hat. Man, I like that shirt. I'll give you $20 for that shirt. I got it. I sized them up. She was about my size in the waist. I said, man, I like them shorts. I'll give you $20 for them shorts. He gave them to me. I got out, walked out, police flying all by. I done changed my appearance and got away. They didn't know me in Florida. They just know me in Michigan. Didn't nobody know me. It's no red. And, um, one of my boys got caught, Arzell Brown, out of Clearwater, Florida, got caught on a burglary and told the police, hey, I can help y'all on some robberies if you help me on 
this case. And uh, he told on himself, man, and they got us all, even his brother, you know, Freddie Harris, you know, they got us all. And uh, he ended up getting uh, 45 years, I think it was, but they raped him and, and uh, he ended up dying. He, uh, they raped him in prison. He, he could have been to the NBA. Uh, hell of a basketball player, man. But that's where that went, man. How much time did you end up with at that time? Uh, I I I tried to take a plea for life, and because uh, back in them days you could get out in seven and a half years on a life sentence. But I had a friend in there from the name that I met that was we got cool named John Hatfield, and he was from the Hatfields and McCoys from Kentucky, and he owned a car business in that down there. And I guess there was I, you know, you know, many years ago. And he told me to use him to try to get my time right. And I tried and he didn't do no good. You know, he, he beat his case. You know, he knew he had his beat. I knew I was hit. And uh, they gave me eight twenties of 15 and 18 months with three mandatory on each one. I took a plea for um, the armed robbery, for half the armed robberies and uh, the other stuff. And, uh, they gave me, like I said, they gave me eight twenties or fifteen, eighteen months, and I went into prison to the adult then. But when I went in, I said to myself, eight twenties or fifteen and eighteen months is a hundred and seventy six and a half years. But they ran it concurrent to one twenty with three mandatory on on the one. So I never thought I was ever going to get out of that because. When I went in back then, man, it, it was it was bad. It was, you know, a white dude didn't have a chance, man. None, man. He either had to do one or two things. That was either pay a war daddy or have a man. There was no, I don't care how bad it was because there was too many of them. There was too many of them to get them. There was no win because they would look at the, the white inmates like, they was the guards' nephews or cousins, or like that there, because the guards would tear us up. As soon as we get off the bus, they, you know, them feet, you know, that big, man, you know, kicking us in the ass, tearing up our stuff. That's just how it went. So, you know, there was a lot of, back then, there was a lot of riots, a lot of, you know, but mostly we go against the guards, you know, but finally, Mark Bedford, Sweet Rankins, Gator, Jack Griffin, them them boys, uh, they they went to killing. They they went to they come, and uh, finally it, it came out to where you know they had their thing, and you know the blacks had theirs. The Haitians, the Cubans, you know there was no gains. There was no when I was in there, there was no gains. No, there were cities like the Bangham, Jacksonville, Lauderdale. Miami, Tampa, you know, we all was homeboys. And I was with Pinellas County with Speedy Moody, you know, Danny Teal, Greyhound, Bosco, you know, Mike Black. We, there was a bunch of us and we all stuck together. Chop, chop, blue, all of us. I went down there about a little over six years ago um, trying to find them, trying to find some of my old homeboys, see what's happening, you know, where they at in life now. And I only found one. Danny Teal in St. Petersburg, Florida. He has some apartment houses and stuff. And I never got a chance to talk to him. I left and came back to Michigan. But all the other ones, either dead or doing life in prison, man. Let's talk a little bit about prison, right? So you get that sentence. How much time do you do straight at that time? How much time do you actually do? Uh, I didn't get out until March 21st, 1990. I got out March 21st, 1990. I pretty much, I was raised in there, man. I was raised in Florida State. How many years was that? Uh, I did, uh, I got locked up when I first got down in 79, 80 to 90, a little over 10. A little over 10. You talk about war daddies. You talk about these white dudes being, you know, either they're pretty much, man, they're getting, you know, bad things are happening yeah. to them, we'll say, right yeah. on YouTube. Tell the people what a war daddy is. I know they've seen some other prison shows, but what was a war daddy like back then? Uh, someone that protects. 
the 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 weaker white crew, someone that takes them under their wing, and they don't have to worry about being raped and dogged out and abused. And uh, I I got big, I, I I got huge. My arms were twenty eight and a half inches. I was big, and I was I didn't give them. I in my mind. I told everybody, I got 176 and a half years. I ain't never been out. I don't give a damn if the sun don't shine. And I seen these things happening to these white dudes, uh, getting raped, getting their stuff took, not being able to eat. And I felt bad. I felt sympathy in my heart for them. And I don't know if that came from my mom's side or what, but I, I don't, I just didn't like it, how it was going down. So I got myself in a position where I could take them under my wing. And I, you know, th that's mine. You know, I got that. You know, that's me. And I, I, I say there's been times where I had 10 or 15 of them, but I didn't have nothing. You know, so they was looking out for me. You know, they would, when the store come, I take them up to the store. They get their stuff and they come on back and when nobody mess with them, you know, and, and I, they have a war. Out. So did you become a war daddy? Yeah. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, I protected uh, a lot of them, man. You know, but nobody knew that I came out of a white woman that my mom was white. If that would have been known, I'd have been in the same position they was in, most likely. What they think they just thought you was light skinned. Yeah, they just called me dirty red. You know, because I was dirty. I was man. I was I was horrible, man. I I went to prison for robbing. When I got there, I I I, I continued to rob. When I was in Florida City. Me and a guy named Bishop, called B, out of West Palm Beach, Florida. We used to, uh, when I first got there, they jumped me. I got jumped um, in the pole barn um, over a cigarette, over over hitting a cigarette, man. Dude wanted to hit my cigarette. I just woke up. I told him, no, nah, come down here. I went down there. They jumped me. They ain't hurt me, you know, because when they seen me in the child line, uh, one of the old heads said, man, y'all ain't did nothing. He ain't got no black eyes or nothing. And they didn't, you know, it's, when you go to fighting a bunch of them, they hitting each other, you know. It, they, I went to the hole and came out and, you know, I started robbing. Um, man, Florida City, when I think back on it now, Florida City had an alligator that nobody talks about. His name was Wally, Wall, and it was on the compound. There was a pond, a big pond, right outside of Miami. It just opened up. I went there, I think it was in 83. It just opened up. And we used to go down to the pavilion and we'd fight. And whoever got knocked out, if you got knocked out and your homeboys couldn't pull you out of there, they'd throw you in that pond where that big alligator at. You know, finally, I don't know what happened. I got transferred out and went to, uh, to Mocha and Daytona Beach. And um, it was the same there. You know, I, I just... A mess up, man. I broke in the canteen there and stole all the cartons of cigarettes. Um, I I used to get paid twenty dollars every Sunday to escort Mercury Morris's wife and his two daughters up to the church for them to go to church. He give me twenty dollars every Sunday, make sure they got there safe, you know, to the church. You ever heard of Eugene Mercury Morris? No, don't know who he is. He was the running back for the Miami Dolphins, uh, the undefeated 1974 uh, Super Bowl champions under Don Shula. And he was there. He got caught with cocaine, and he was there. Uh, we was in Florida City together in the early 80s. And, uh, Talk a little bit more about this war daddy thing, right? I mean, are these war daddies victimizing these dudes? I mean, not just financially, but in different ways? They could. They could. You know, that, that's theirs. You know, when you're a war daddy, that's your property. And you got to protect them, and they're going to take care of you. If you don't protect them, you ain't you ain't getting paid. They'll check in. But they go to PC, protective custody, and they lock down, and then you lose. You know? Let me so, ask you a question. Let's say there's a beef, right? You got 15 dudes underneath you. You're beefing with another war daddy. You guys go to war, all your, your little dudes that are with you, they start fighting with you and helping you? Do you mentally well, convince them? No, 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 no. They don't do no fighting. They they don't do nothing but stay out the way. You know, they don't make no noise. They don't get in no 
none of that there. That's what I'm. That's what I was for is to protect them, not to put them out there in it. You what know, happens and, if you and another war daddy get into it and you lose? You go to the hole and someone takes over your your stable. It ain't never happened. It ain't never happened. But it, but it, I mean. No, they go. They go use it, brass out, or something. A lot of them lock up because they can't do it on their own, so they'll lock up. But usually, when you have it with with somebody that's solid and real, that that's a killer, you got. You know what you got to do? You got to kill them, man. You got. You got to take it to them. You, you know there ain't no no room for half step and letting them come back. Cause I there was a time where I seen the meat wagon at the Sally Port Gate come three or four times in one day, taking bodies out of there. You know, when I first went in, um, when they sent me over to BTU, and uh, I went and was working over the, in the unit, I used to see it, oh man, all the time. Murders, rapes. I They used to, at night, they was in a pole barn. And, um, you know, the bunks all lined up. And um, I used to see the dudes get down on the floor and put their shank in their mouth. And they crawl like ninjas down low to the ground. And they get to the bunk where the new dude come in. And they put put the shank to their throat and climb up in the bed with them, man. Next thing you know, you know, you hearing the sounds and, you know, you know what's going on, man. And that happened, that happened a lot, man. That happened a lot, but back then, it was like I said. I seen a lot of um, of the podcasts and videos that made me want to come out and speak on it because it's changed. Not that I'm not glad it's changed, but you know, it's not like it was when I was in there 44 years ago. It's totally different. When you, back then, if you went to the Rock, Rayford. They put the candy and the cigarettes on your bunk. And, you know, everybody knows you don't eat the candy. You don't smoke the cigarettes. Well, the new cock, the new one that comes in, the fish, they'll take the stuff and they'll put it in the locker and lock it up. And then they send the, the dude. They, they being watched the whole time. They send the dude down. The dude comes down. Hey, man, I want my cigarettes and my candy I left on the bunk. Well, the dude. Gives the guy the cigarettes and the candy. Here it is, man. I, I ain't know who's what. Gives it to him. About five minutes later, he nods up on the tier. Here comes this big old muscle-bound, gold-teeth black dude. Hey, man. Got his shank. Hey, man. Where my cigarettes and my candy at? I'll either want some shit on my dick or some blood on my knife. And, hey, they, 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 that's where it's at. They either, you know, I seen a lot of them commit suicide, man. I seen a lot of them um, get raped, commit suicide, um, man. I seen a lot of shit, man. I I can't even tell you all the shit I seen, but I seen I seen a homeboy. They had been homeboys came up in the streets together. The moms went to church together. He came in. His homeboy, happy to see him, man. Yeah, what's up, homeboy? He give him a shank. He said, man, you're going to need this knife in here. You know, you rather get caught with it than to get caught without it. He, tell, he says, come up after count. When the gates open, we'll have a drink and smoke. He goes up there to the cell, man. He put, gives him a drink. They smoke. He put the shit in there. He passes out. My man takes the knife back from him. When he wakes up, his booty hole hurting, man. Man, man. And this is a kid he went to church with? Yeah. yeah. His moms, the moms went to church because they used to play and hang out together. They was friends coming up, best friends. Friends like and, that needs enemies, right? No, you know, no, man. You There's no friends in there, man. There, no. Let's man. talk about another subject, Michael, right? I know something else happens in your life, man. Something dramatic. I know you got two kids, and I want to mention that we're going to help them out because I know you're living on what, like seven hundred, eight hundred dollars a month trying to take care of two kids. And you turned your life around. Obviously, you turned your life around. You're free. How long yeah. you been free, Michael? Uh, I got free December thirteenth, two thousand and eight. 
this December will be 16 years. 16 uh, years you've been free. I'm going to put your picture in the in, in the thumbnail probably when you were big and jacked up. But something else happens to you, man, and you end up, you know, tell the people what, what happens with you, man, with the HIV thing. Man, um, I was in jail for beating up the police, Johnny May. He was a corrupt, racist police in the city. And um, they locked me up. And uh, I was locked up for 10 months on parole. I was on parole. I just got out of prison. I went in uh, 93 and got out in 98 in Michigan. And uh, I got into it with this police officer. He kept messing with me. I told him. We got into it. They get me, uh, take me to jail. I'm in there on parole. I know I'm going back to prison. I'm in there for 10 months. And uh, that I had a bunkie. And uh, he was a uh, number one suspect in a murder case. He killed his wife and threw her in the river. And uh, I never asked him about his shit. You know, other people was talking, you know. I didn't care because I'm going back to prison. It, it's not my business. That's his shit. Well, he got out and he came back to see me. And when he, in, in the jail, he beat his case on a domestic. They couldn't charge him with the murder because they ain't have enough evidence. So he gets out and he comes back, see me, the guards tell the detectives, hey, uh, Holder might be able to help you. You know, he, uh, him and Sabatini, cool, him and dude, cool. So they uh, call me out and they ask me what I know about the case. A light goes off in my head, I want to get free. I said, man, I know everything. I, I know where the body went in. I probably know where it came up. I know everything, man. He told, but he ain't going to talk to me in here. I said, you got to get me out. They got me out, man. Uh, I think it was two days later. They took me down to court, dropped the uh, case with beating up the officer, and let me out to assist them. Well, a couple of days later, they come and pick me up. He's in the flower shop. They wanted me to bump into him so we could hook up uh because we used to play a lot of chess hook up a chess uh game so i could get information and uh when we met up i wasn't wired there was nothing on me and uh i went in i seen him things were said you know hey i'm out this is why i'm out you know i don't want to say too much but uh they know i told them i told them what was up we shook hands, and I told I went back out, I showed them, went back out to the car, told them, what, you know, told them, hey, yeah, we're going to play chess. They, they come, and they asked me to call. I told them, if you ever see me, don't go the other way. Don't talk to me. Don't never. If I call, blow me off. So every time I call, he blow me off. Oh, no, I got to work a double today. I, I can't talk to you, you know. So finally, they got tired of it. They knew. Every time they pulled me over, I'd be out doing what I'm doing, acting a fool. I tell them, shh, I'm working on a big case. Sabatinka, every time they let me go. But when they found out what I did to them, man, they sent my best friend, man. I got the paperwork, man. I, I, so let me stop you so people understand this. You didn't tell on anyone. You tricked the police, acting like you were going to yeah. help them. And you got yeah. you told your boy, like, yo, this is what it is. So Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and they hated you me. You were playing chess with the police. Hey, I wanted my freedom, and I didn't feel like I deserved what they was doing to me anyhow, man. And then, you know, now it's even it's even worse. It's even worse now, man, because they know what I did. They, man, I was sitting in the Bay County Jail facing two life sentences in 30 years and no plea agreement. And... The doctor came in on June 23rd of 2000 and said, prepare for expiration. You got days to live. I didn't have a dime in my account. I didn't have a person I could call. I had nothing. And I just prayed. I said, you know, God, you know, I was strong. I was tough. I was bad. I was labeled the leader of the biggest gang in my city. You know, and then I was as low as well shit. I was as low as you can go. Didn't nobody want to talk to me, see me, be around me. Everybody turned their back on me, man. Everybody. I ain't have nothing or nobody, man. And, uh, they gave me 11 white women and one white man. Had them fill out a jury questionnaire to see who would be racist. 
And the ones that said they was racist, they supposed to strike them off the jury. Instead, the ones that said they was racist, they put them on my jury. The alleged victim recanted and cleared me, said she lied and she loved me and wanted to be with me. And they still convicted me and gave me the max and sent me away to die, man. How much time did they give you? How much time did they give you? I, I stayed in jail in solitary confinement for 538 days, and then they gave me 10 to 15 years flat. Tell the people what that was for, though. You didn't say specifically. Was it failure for the... Failure to inform an HIV. Failure it... to inform. She didn't go to them. They went to her. She didn't go to the police. She didn't go to them. They went to her because they wanted to destroy me for not being a snitch, for tricking them for using them. So they let's talk me. about the let's talk about the HIV thing. How does that come about? Is that from using drugs? I mean, what's the situation? Females. When I got out of prison in Florida, I was big, tough, strong, bad, you know. And I was I like to party and have fun and go to the titty bars. You know, I was out in Vegas, California, Phoenix, Arizona. I'm just out having fun and I was big, you know, I was huge. And um uh, I get any woman I want. I was getting all kinds of women, whatever I want. I look at them, I get them. You know, I had all kinds of women. And I never heard when I was in prison in Florida, they said, if you shoot dope or if you mess with a homosexual, you'll get skinny and die. You'll get AIDS and you'll die. So I wasn't worried about all that shit. I came out and had two healthy babies born next, but my two oldest kids were both born in 1991. You know, and I, I talk to them regularly. I got a good relationship with my children, you know, now. But, um, yeah, man, I came out and had two healthy babies then, but I was still in the streets. I was still out there wild, you know, just living that street life, you know, doing drugs, uh, stealing, lying, robbing, cheating, doing whatever, man. And uh, end up, So you end up with HIV. You give it to a woman. You're arrested. They give you 10 to 15 years because you didn't inform her that you were HIV infected. Yeah, well, I told them to test her. They told me, you're not being charged with infecting her. You're being charged with not informing her. The crime is failure to inform. So it doesn't matter whether they got infected or not or where it comes from. You can't tell where it came from. It could, you could have got it two years ago from whoever. You know, you can't tell. You know, and she knew what she did. She, you know, and she stuck by me the whole time. She she had money in my account before I got to prison. You know, she came and seen me everywhere I was at. You know, she you know she she was there for me. You know, and then when I got out on parole, they said we couldn't have no no contact. But she was there for me the whole time I was in there, man. So now I know you got two younger kids, right? You got a fourteen year old boy, and and how old's your daughter? Six. Your daughter's six. Both of them are good. No, no, no issues. Born natural birth, healthy. Where's their mother at? Uh, my my daughter's mother's out in Essexville. Um, she's young, beautiful young girl. Um, just wow, she's not. I I couldn't let my daughter stay there, man. After the third time, the police called me for domestic violence. Um, I kept her. They tried to tell me to give her back, but no, man, I kept her. You got your kids both living with you. You're living kind of like on Social Security, right? Exactly. I am living on it. That's all I get. I I've never gotten child support or none of that there. I just get nine forty one a month. I pay seven hundred rent, and then the rest I uh, pay our our phone, you know, our internet. I pay our family uh, YMCA membership, and then I I pray. I try to make it. I got faith, man. I got I got a lot of faith, man. And I just, you know, things just always seem to come through, even when I don't know how I'm going to make it, where it's going to come. It hurts me. Not for me, because I've been locked up all my life. I, you know, you can put me in a matchbox with two scoops of dirt and three mustard seeds, and I'll come out fat. But I'm concerned with my kids, man. I like to take my kids and go to the beach, go to the fair, go to the zoo, go to the museum. I like doing things with my kids, and I can't. I can't now because I ain't got a license, man. I lost them in 09 before I ever had any kids. When I first came home, I didn't know how people were going to react to me. How? Because, you know, I'd been gone for eight and a half years, man. I didn't know how I was going to come back. Everybody talking bad about me, hating on me, spitting venom on me. 
And when I came back, I thought they was all, you know, I was going to have to go to war. I was going, you know, it wasn't going to go good. But Listen, it, man, it, this, this is what I'm going to do, right? I don't pay people for interviews, but I am going to do something for your kids. I'm going to buy some shoes and some short sets. It's summertime. I'm going to help out. I want to help out, right? That's what I want to do. Let's talk about some real shit, man. Let's talk about some real shit, right? Anybody uh, wants to donate to you, man, they, I don't know if you have a cash app or whatever. We'll, we'll figure something out, right? I'll put your cash app up. Or they can send it to me and I'll get it to you. I don't want people to donate on today's show to me. Don't send me a dollar, man. I want to help this brother out because, yeah, he's been through some shit. Some crazy things have happened. But he's got two beautiful little kids, man, that need some help. So I'm helping you. If other people want to help, they can. How old are you right now, Michael? Uh, I'm 62. I'll be 63 September 15th. And uh... This is some real shit right here. You're you're older. You You, you have HIV. If you pass away, who's going to take care of that six-year-old little girl, man? Uh, Grandma Heidi. Heidi. She's been in her life. She's not, per se, technically her real grandma. But when my mom passed away in Florida, my white mother, I went there. And my daughter, I came back to see my daughter born. And then I had to go back down there. Well, when I went back down there about a week later, see, I see my baby mama on live. So I'm like, where's where's my daughter? Who's watching my daughter? You know, and then my son calls and said, Daddy, I want you. Come home. And two days later, I was on a plane, left everything, man. Left all my clothes. I left everything, man. Came home. Came home to my kids. And I've been here ever since. I never went back. You know, they down there. I have three different houses. Uh, took my stuff, my clothes and stuff to hold it for me. Because when I was in Florida, um, when I got out of prison, I met a dude named Hicks. He's, we, we're like this. He's my best friend. And um, he stuck by me the whole time I was in prison, man. Every birthday, he'd come and see me. And if I needed a package or I needed some money, he'd send it. You know, he was always there for me. But, you know, he came and picked me up when I got out of prison in 1990, you know, and I talked to him, you know, we don't talk as much as we used to, but we still talk. I talked to him like a week ago, man. You know, he's old, he's older than me. He um we had a lot of fun, man. He he was a um he built a 68 VW Volkswagen van. He I want to bring Hold on now. I want to bring you I want to talk about what's going to happen with them kids, man. The kids? You know, I wanna, yeah, I want to make sure that they're going to be all right, man. You're up there oh, in they eight. Gonna be, they're going to be a, they're going to be all right. They I mean I'm planning. I'm not planning on going over no time soon, man. I'm no, brother. What I'm trying to say is this: I want to make sure that them kids are going to be taken care of, right? So you talking about grandma and all of that? They're going to be good if something happens to you. Yeah, I'm. I pray. I pray. I, 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 listen. I want to talk a little bit about their mother, right? You know, their mother was. You know, was she out there? You know, using and, and doing things she shouldn't have been doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does she kind of have her life together now, or is she still out there in the street? Still out there. Still out there. Not infected or no? No, not affected. And th- this is what I want to ask you, right? Because I know that, you know, because of you, they ended up changing some stuff, and there was some big, you know, some big things went to the big courts, and they no longer can charge people with, you know, not informing or any of that because of your case, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um. When I went to prison, I never, like I said, they told me in nineteen August in nineteen ninety three when I went into Jackson State Prison here in Michigan, they said I tested positive, and uh, I didn't know how to take it at that time. I didn't take it because um, when I was in Florida prison my Bible fell on the ground. I had one of them little brown Bibles and a little half a toothbrush. I was in the hole. And I didn't understand ye, y'all, the all, shaw. I didn't understand all that. But when the Bible fell, I picked it up. And I and it had a crease in the page. And I went to reading it. And it said, even it was Ecclesiastics 9, verse 4. And it read, even a live dog is better off than a dead lion. And it made sense to me. And I, then from that point forward, I never wanted to die no more. You know, before I, I, I feel that somebody killed me, they'd be doing me a favor. I didn't give a damn. 
you know, but then I, when I said that, I said a hurricane can come and blow me out and I could win the lottery, you know, anything could happen. So when they told me I was HIV positive and other people, I heard them saying, if I test positive, I'm jumping, I'm slitting my wrist, I'm hanging. And I seen people do all these things. And I thought about it, but I said, what if I jump down here today and tomorrow they come out with a cure? I can't say I want to come back and get it. I'm gone. So I had to fight and stay in the game. And and, and then they came out with uh, Bruce Richmond. I've spoken with him. Uh, he's the one that created U equals U uh, out of New York. Uh, Bruce Richmond's in like, I don't know how many countries right now, but U equals U, I was able, I don't have a, a GD or high school diploma. Or, I didn't graduate. I stayed, I was locked up all my life. So I never had a chance, but I educated myself when I was in solitary confinement. And I got up on you equals you, undetectable equals untransmittable. So if you test positive for HIV, within six months time, you can come to undetectable where you can't pass it. You can have babies, you, you know, it, it's life. It's, you know, you can, you can go on and live. And a lot of people are unaware of that. A lot of people don't know that. And I, you know, the stigma needs to be broken. It, it's been too many years. I've had it for over 30 years and I've never been sick or in the hospital. I, you know, every test I took when I went to prison came back not detected. And then I came out and I, after doing eight and a half years in prison for failure to inform HIV, having sex with a white woman, I come out and that's the first damn thing I do is have unprotected sex with a white woman and have a healthy, beautiful baby born natural birth that I raise and take care of, man. And uh, eight years later, well, at first they was mad. Oh, they threatened me with jail. They made me go piss in a cup, everything. But then when they got, they was waiting to get the, the results back from the hospital that my son was born in because they thought that he was infected and the mother was infected and everything else. But when the paperwork came in, it showed that neither one of them were infected. So then they said, well, that can't be mine. That's She's cheating. That's somebody else's child. So I went and paid the money and I got the paternity test done. And I got it. And it came back. He's got more me in him than he does his mama. So I went back down there to the courthouse and I said, look, y'all convict people and send them away for DNA. How about this DNA? Put my name on that birth certificate. You know, I'm the father. You know, put my name on there. And they did. And when they did that, it, it made me feel like I, they just handed me a master's degree, man. You know, it, it was the happiest, one of the happiest days of my life, man. And um, eight years later, I did it again. I had a little girl, beautiful little girl. And I've been raising them both, you know, on my own, by myself, single father, for years, for years. And now, you know. Say this, right? Because before we started this interview, right? In, we talked and then then it, you know when i sent you the link it just it, it kind of bothered me man it kind of hurt me right because you had said something like man sometimes man i think it's just easier being in prison i told you hey man them kids need you man you can't, yeah, it is you can't ever think it's about more it. rewarding it's easier but it's not more rewarding i would never i don't even do i don't do nothing i don't steal or rob or cheat i don't do none of that lie i don't do none of that i changed my whole life around to be with my kids, I, you know, even though I want to take care of them, I want more for them. I've never had that. I've never worked. I've never, I've never worked a year in my whole life out in the streets, like a job. I've never gotten social care tax and none of that. There. I don't, I've never worked. I've always worked in prison, you know, and the only way I've ever known to make it is by selling dope, robbing, stealing, you know, playing females, you know, all that stuff, man. And I don't do none of that. It ain't, I don't do nothing that ain't right. I don't, I try to treat people like I want to be treated, you know, and I, I try to treat everybody good. Even if they treat me bad, I try to treat people good, man. And I'm just blessed, man. I, you know, even when I don't have and I'm struggling and going through it, my worst day out here beats my best day in there. I'm glad you, know? you said that, man. You know, you've been through a lot. You've seen a lot in your life, Michael. 
I'm not calling you Dirty Red, man. I'm calling you Michael, all right? You're a all right. <laughs> Thanks, man. You're living a law-abiding life, man. No more Dirty Red, man. It's Michael from this point forward, man. You got to take care of them kids, man, because that's the most important thing in your life, right? Yes. Yeah, definitely. And, man, they told me I went to court, uh, Bay City. They mad because I've been speaking the truth. They don't want the truth out. And they've shut it down three times already from three big organizations. And I went to court. The only thing they can get me for is driving on suspended because I got to get my kids to school. I got to take them to counseling. I got to take them to their doctor's appointments. And I'm a single father. And my landlord put plates, insurance. You know, she's a retired police officer. She's the head chemist in Bay City. She's the head scientist in Bay City. You know, and she put it in there because she wants me to be able to take care of my kids and that. They said they had no problem with me driving as long as there was insurance and plates and everything was legal. But when I spoke out against them, they told me if I drive, they're going to charge me with contempt of court and this and that. And uh, now my kids can't get to school, man. My, 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 my son, I can't take him to school. I've never not taken him to school. I would pick him up and take him to school every, every day. And I can't now. You know, I can't take them to the park. I can't, I can't even drive because I'm scared that they're going to put me in jail and silence me. You know, Listen, Mike, man, yeah. you know, I appreciate you coming on. I'm going to put your cash app up for anybody that might want to donate to you. I'm going to do something myself for you, man. I appreciate um, it. Man. I, I want to do it, man. I want to, I want to help those kids out, man. Um, I appreciate it. But look, man, you know, I appreciate you coming on, sharing your story, sharing your experiences, which is a crazy, crazy thing. You know, you've been through some stuff. You lived a crazy life, man. I'm glad that you've been free for 16 years. But I'm even more happier that, you know what, man, as a single father living with HIV, you're taking care of your kids, man. They need you. They love you. I see the pictures on Instagram. Those kids need their dad, man. Without you, remember, without you, man, they're going to suffer. So it ain't about you no more, Michael. No. It's about them, man. Yeah. It's not, you know, it's not about me at all, man. My my life, you know, I, I, I wouldn't be here. If it wasn't for them kids, because when I first got out, even after I went through all I did, when I got out, I had three charges in three different counties. I was going to Detroit, getting dope. You know, I was selling it. I was, you know, I was in the streets. I was right back out here. But then when my son was born, that was it. That was it. Uh, that was it. And then I, my daughter, she was the icing on the cake. My son took the cake, but then my daughter was the icing on the cake. You know, and man, they mean everything in the world to me, man. I mean, I'd be, I, I wouldn't even know how to even make, I, I wouldn't be here. I know I'd either be doing life or I'd be dead. If it wasn't for them kids, they changed my whole life, man. You know, and man. I don't do wrong. So I'm going to tell people, man, if they want, man, hit that cash app. If you like what we're doing, hit that like button, subscribe to the channel. I thought this was going to be a bang them up interview about Florida prison and it turned into something different, but it turned into something positive. Again, Michael, man, I appreciate you. I'm going to tell people, man, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button with respect until tomorrow. We're out.